cool about that song because in one way you see death being arrested and it being in captivity. And us, because of what Jesus has done, we have life and freedom. Not because of us, not because of what we've done or haven't done, but simply because of what Jesus has done. He arrested death. He has put death in captivity. And so we can be like Paul when he writes, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Because it has been arrested, it is now captive, but now we have freedom and life because of that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have come to bring us life and bring it to the full. And so we no longer have to look at death as the end. We don't have to look at death as something that we are subject to. Because when this life, quote unquote, on earth is over, it has just begun for the believer. So we can celebrate that. Because Jesus, you rose, we can rise. Because you conquered death, we also now can conquer death. And celebrate that. And know with confidence that, Father, you have made a way where there was before no other way. When we look to you, we know and we trust that. God, you're so good. We thank you for this time, for this opportunity to come and to just worship you together as a family. God, as we now move on to other things, God, we ask that you just continue to minister. We just continue to be among us. And everything that's said and everything that's done, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Hope that you're doing well. Let's take a few minutes to shake some hands, hug some necks. Let's love on each other a little bit. And then you may be seated.
All right. Well, hope that you're doing well. Hope that you had a good week. Want to welcome those that are uh, online that are joining us. Thank you so much for for joining us. As we kind of mentioned last week, um, we've had a little bit of issue in the last couple of months, off and on, with YouTube um, and our worship. And we've been flagged several times. Um, and and typically, when we're flagged, they like I said last week, they come back and basically say, "Oh, sorry, you know, we shouldn't have shut you down. You're fine." Um, but a couple of weeks ago, we got a, a more serious um, email from them, and so we just don't want to risk um, actually being taken completely off of YouTube. So we've decided for the time being to kind of just have our, our message online. So for those that are just now joining us, thank you so much for understanding and your patience. We ask that uh, hopefully we'll get it figured out real soon. But at this point, we just figured that it was better to make sure that we were online um, than to keep getting flagged and then pulled offline and then pull, put back on and so on and so forth. So uh, again, just so you know, we have everything that we need uh, to be online, but it's just sometimes uh, the algorithm or whatever just says, oh, this isn't okay. So we have to kind of figure it out. But anyway, um, want to welcome those that are online. Obviously, those that are here, thank you so much for joining us. If you have offering this morning, offerings up here to my right and left, you can also give online. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving. Uh, I want to pray for the offering, then we have a couple other announcements. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this day. God, for this time, this opportunity to come and be together. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you and to partner with you in what you desire to do. And Father, we ask that you just take this gift, God, and you just use it for your kingdom. God, that you would just bless it and just multiply it. And uh, Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, a couple of announcements to talk about real fast. Uh, our community groups are going to be starting up very, very soon. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet this week out in the foyer. So if you're interested in being a part of a community group, and we really want as many as can be to be a part of a group, we think it's very important here, uh, please sign up. And, and let us know. On that sheet, you know, there's days to pick. We usually have groups on Fridays, Friday nights, Saturday night, and Sunday nights. Also, um, there's information. We do need your email. I know most of, of your emails I have already. Excuse me, but that's how we communicate a lot with uh, the, the community groups, give you the, the lessons and things like that that are coming up, questions that you're going to be discussing and all those sort of things. And also, if you're interested in hosting a community group, please also mark that. There's a place there to mark that as well. Uh, we may not use everybody this time around, but if you are available for that, that would be awesome as we kind of put our groups together. So um, our hope is to kind of get those groups started at the end of August, but if things kind of take a little longer than we expect, we can always start them in September. So we're kind of looking at early, uh, sometime around that time frame. Um, so if you're interested in being in a community group, we think it's really important. I think it's really important to be in one. And so if you're available, either Friday night, Saturday night, or Sunday night, please mark that down. And I believe, um, Linda, I believe the sheet says basically mark what day you're not available on those. So, because that way, that way, you know, if you're available, hey, I can do Friday or Sunday. That way we can try to put you in a group. But uh, just make sure you put the day, I believe. Just read the sheet. Do that. Do that. Read. You know, that's important. Anyway, um, and, and let us know. Next week is obviously the first Sunday of August, and we're heading to Jason's Deli to have lunch together. So if you don't have lunch plans, you do now. Uh, come have lunch with us next week at Jason's Deli after service. Um, that would be awesome. It's always fun, and enjoy that. And uh, so next week is Jason's Deli week. And then also, one other thing, obviously last week we had a little bit of an issue with our AC unit um, and David Shank and Alan Shank came out on Thursday, looked at it and um, David was, was amazing. He basically went, I think this is what we need. Uh, we, you know, and here's the thing, you know, the Lord takes care of us, doesn't he? I mean, you know, sometimes something, you know, because I don't know about you, but this is what I do. The AC stops working and I'm going, okay, how many thousands of dollars is it going to take to get this fixed, you know? And, and, and David shows up, you know, and, and he and Alan start looking around. They pull this thing off. David comes and he goes, I think it's this. And I said, okay, well, how much does that cost? And I'm going, $400, $500. He goes, I think it's about 30 bucks. And it was. And so we ordered the part. I, I, I was very helpful. I ordered the part on Amazon. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Checks in the mail, Jim. Thank you. Anyway. Um, 
and the part came, and David literally came early this morning, took him, because he's amazing at this sort of stuff, took him, you know, two minutes. He put the part on, and it's very cool in here. So, David, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Alan, as well, he came out to help. So, again, if, if, if you're not sweating this morning, please thank David and Alan after service, because uh, they were awesome and, you know, very, very well done. So, thank you guys very much for that help. All right, let's go ahead and, and jump into the message. We are actually concluding our, our, our series called Wait For It um, this morning. And, and we're going to kind of do kind of an interesting thing at the very end, but I'll kind of wait till we get there. But uh, again, as we've kind of looked at this series, we've kind of talked about this idea of waiting on the Lord, what that looks like, how do we do that, why it's important, and all those sort of things. Um, and this morning, as we kind of conclude this series, um, I'm excited because, you know, I kind of want to put a bow on not just, just today, but on the series as a whole. Um, and, and because I think my hope and my prayer, as we talked about at the very beginning of this, was that we would get to the point where when it came to waiting on the Lord and patience and all those sort of things, uh, that we wouldn't look at it as, as a curse, but we would really look at it as a blessing. We would look at it as a way to grow and experience uh, things that God wants us to experience in that time. And we've talked about so many different things, but this morning as we kind of conclude our series, I want to kind of kind of finish it off by kind of looking at something maybe a little bit different, but it does kind of fit along with that idea of waiting and, and things like that. And, and here's why. I don't know if you've ever done this. I know that we see it at times in Scripture. Uh, I know that I do it a lot. Sometimes very, very, quote unquote, spiritual or trying to be spiritual in prayer. And other times, just honestly, at the weirdest times in my life. But I, I tend to have this sort of mindset when I'm waiting on the Lord. God maybe has promised something or something I want to happen or whatever happens. Or, or a lot of times it's this. There's a direction that I'm looking, going, God, where do I go right? Do I go left? What do I do here? Um, maybe for you, it's, it, maybe what job do I take? Or maybe do I ask this girl to marry me? Or, or what, what school do I put my child in? Or whatever it might be. And you have this type of mindset and you kind of ask God this, sometimes really serious, sometimes just out of just kind of throwing your hands up, not knowing what to do, you say, God, will you please just give me a sign? You ever done that? I know I have. God, give me a sign. I'll do silly things like that. Like, like I know this is weird and this, is, this should not surprise you. If this surprises you, you do not know me well, okay? We have a water purifier in my house and, and my wife will totally admit this, so to, I'm not being mean. My wife is a water snob, okay? She likes her water. So we have this water purifier thing and there's these jars or, or, or bottles and we fill them up and put them in the refrigerator so they're cold. And so I'll sit there and it takes some time to get the water to fill up and I'll be sitting there, God, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do that? God, the microwave is going. God, there's 48 seconds left. If this bottle fills up before the microwave goes off, then I will know that this is what you want me to do. And it happens and then I go, okay, but you know, God, I really don't think that's enough. You know, I'm silly. But we do that a lot. And here's what I found too. Dealing with people in, in the world and in my job and, and even just going to, to, to Walmart or Sprouts or whatever. You know what I found people will do? They'll say things like this. Maybe you've said something like this. You've heard somebody say like this. God, if you're real, God, if you're really there, give me a sign. Now here's the thing. In scripture, we see times where like Gideon where he asks for a sign and God gives him a sign he puts out a fleece and basically says if it's wet in the morning the ground's dry then then I'll know and he takes it one step further and he says you know you know and then the next morning if the fleece is dry and the ground is wet, whatever and and God does that there's other times in scripture where where the Pharisees go to Jesus and and they say give us a sign and Jesus's response is very interesting he says, a wicked generation, adulterous generation, seeks a sign. But he says this, he says, no sign will be given unto them besides the sign of Jonah, which is the concept of Jonah being in the whale for three days. And Jesus says, you're going to get that sign. So it's interesting that in some ways, sometimes we see God almost answer with signs and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he looks at it and says, you've already had some signs. I, I would say this, at least because I've experienced it in my life, where I believe God has given me some signs and some direction. I believe that God desires to lead us. And God does that in many, many different ways. 
The danger is when we seek the sign and not the sign giver. Okay? The problem, why Jesus called the Pharisees this problem, is because they had already seen multiple signs. Jesus had healed the blind. He had healed the sick. He had done many, 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 many signs, and it just wasn't good enough. And so Jesus says, listen, you're going to get one more sign, and it's going to be the ultimate sign. So listen, when we ask for signs, I've had people ask me, is it wrong to ask for a sign? I don't think it is. What I think is wrong is when we look at the signs and we don't look to Jesus. Because the signs always point to him and his word, okay? So, uh, you know, when we talk about this sort of thing, I want to kind of help us with that, you know, because sometimes we do do it and say, God, you know, it comes from a very, very honest place. God, I really want to know what to do. Will you lead me here and guide me and direct me? And I believe God wants to do that. We don't want to be like the Pharisees who have Jesus right in front of them but demand something else. You see, here's what I truly believe. I believe God is speaking, and I believe God speaks to every single one of us. That is not the question. The question is, are we listening? Are we seeing what he has placed before us? Or are we demanding something to justify our lack of action or our action? Something we have to look at. But even greater than that, what I do know, I do know without a shadow of a doubt, is our God is a God of signs and wonders. That is who he is. Look at Deuteronomy 26, 8. It says this, So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and a powerful arm. I love this. With overwhelming terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. That's who our God is. Our God is a God of signs and wonders. He is not a God who is, who is weak and, and, and passive. He is a God who desires to show up and show out who he is and what he can do in our lives and through our lives. And not only is our Father a God of signs and wonders, but so is our Jesus. Look at Acts 2, 22. As Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says, People of Israel, listen! God publicly endorses Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. I believe that God wants to be a God of powerful signs and wonders. Now, again, we don't seek the sign, we don't seek the wonder, we seek Jesus. And when a powerful sign and wonder comes up from Jesus, guess what? It points to Jesus. The litmus test is real easy. When you see signs and wonders that are pointing to a person, you need to stay away. When they're pointing to Jesus, we can embrace those. But even then, we have to be very careful and have some discernment. But we do believe that our God does miraculous, major things in our hearts and in our lives. And here's the deal. The greatest thing that you have ever... Because here's the thing. Whether you believe it or not, and I've said this before, you have had one of the greatest signs and wonders that has ever taken place in a human being's life if you've accepted Jesus. You went from spiritual death to spiritual life. That is an amazing wonder. You, in all of your sin, all of your filth, all, all of us are this way. And when we went to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you forgive me? Will you take away my guilt and my shame? He did. That's a wonder. That makes me sit there and go, God, how could you love us that much? That you would take our sin and wipe it away. You have experienced in your life so many signs and so many wonders. And I've said this many times before. I believe that we have no earthly idea how many we've experienced. But when we get to heaven and we experience eternity with Jesus, we're going to have a better idea and we're going to be blown away. I'd rather just say, you know what? I'm ignorant now, but I know my God is a God of signs and wonders. And he does those things for his people. He does it for those that are weak. He does it for those that need his help. He does it for those, honestly, that are they're in a place of even strength to show who he is. He loves to make himself known to people, and he loves to do that. Our God is a God of signs and wonders. 
So as we are sitting here, as we're waiting, as we're trusting, as we're looking for the promises of God to come forth, we need to claim that promise. God, you're a God of signs and wonders. God, you're a God that does miraculous miracles in people's lives. And I trust that you will bring those things about in your time and in your way. But listen, listen, that's not really what the message is about. We're really going to get into what the message is about now because our God doesn't just want to do signs and wonders for you. He wants to do them through you. Okay? Now listen, I know some of you are going to go, whoa, 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 whoa. No, Aaron, no, no. This is, this is for pastor stuff. This is for that crazy like evangelist that came in the 70s with the three-piece suit. Like, you know, no, 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 no. This isn't for the normal, every day I have a regular nine-to-five job. And you know what? I'm just going to be, I'm loving you right now. Look how loving I am. You're so wrong. You're so wrong. God wants to do these things through you. It's not just about what he wants to do for you, even though he does and he will. He wants you to do signs and wonders through you. Let me prove it to you. We're going to look in Acts. This section, we're going to look at Acts. You know why? Because Acts, whether you know this or not, never ended. You read the book of Acts. It is crazy. You read the book of Acts and you're like, you know, you read the book and you're like, you're ready to turn the page and then the book ends. No, Acts never ends. Well, let me phrase that. Acts hasn't ended yet. Guess what? Acts is about the church age. Acts is still going on. I'll tell you when Acts ends, okay? When Jesus comes back and takes us home, Acts, period. We're not there yet. So here's what you need to understand, because this is going to blow your mind a little bit, but you need to hear this. Everything that happens in Acts should still be happening today. We are in the same time. The things that God and Jesus and the Spirit did in Acts that you read about, God desires to continue to do today. And here's the thing. He is. He is. He is. So let's look at this together. Let's see what is happening in the book of Acts. We're going to go through several of these. Let's start first with Acts 2. In Acts 2, Peter has the, the gift of the Holy Spirit has come. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has come. And now Peter is preaching to the multitude who has gathered around. And this is what he says. He really starts his sermon this way. He says, in the last days, he's quoting from Joel here, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. All people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That's a sign and a wonder. Your young men will see visions of wonder and and, and and a sign. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on on my servants, men and women alike. And they will prophesy. Let's keep going. Verse 19. And I will cause, listen here, I will cause wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire, clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I know so many of us have heard that verse before, but let's remember what is being communicated here by the prophet Joel. When Joel is communicating this prophecy, the idea of prophecy, the idea of visions was very narrow. It was very limited to a small group of people. You know some of these people. They're in your scriptures. They're Isaiah, they're Jeremiah, they're Ezekiel, they're Micah, they're Daniel. They're those types of people. But what Joel is prophesying here that Peter is now saying has become a reality is now God's spirit is poured out on everyone. Everyone. The idea here is not limited. Well, I'm an old man, so I'll do this. Or I'm a young man, I'll do this. The idea is that everyone, old, young, male, female, servant, not servant, every individual will be used by God to bring forth something miraculous, something greater than themselves. So he even starts with this idea that God wants to do it through everybody, but it continues on here. Look at Acts 5.12. Acts 5.12, it says the apostles 
were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. Now listen, this one, we like this one, don't we? Okay? Because this is, what this is, oh, see, see, Aaron, it's the special people. It's the pastors. It's the Sunday school teachers. It's, it's not me. Oh, wait a minute. We just looked at Joel. We just looked at Acts 2. But let's continue on here. Let's, let's, let's kind of blow your myth a little bit more out of the water. Let's look at Acts 6, 8. Let's look at Acts 6, 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Who was Stephen? Just a guy. Just a guy. Just a guy. He wasn't, he wasn't Peter. He wasn't John. He wasn't one of the apostles. He was a guy that they looked at and, and he was going to help in leadership, yes. But he was just, he was a lay person, if that'll help you out. If that makes you feel better. He was one of you. Does that help? I hate that. I don't like this. I don't, there's no dividing line here, but does that make you feel a little bit better? He was just one of you. And yet God used him to perform, listen, great wonders and signs. God used him to do those things. Okay, well, but, but you know, Aaron, you know, you don't know what's happened. You don't know my past. You don't know the things I've done. You know, yes, God saved me. Yes, God has, has, has redeemed me, all this. But, but you know what? Again, that, that, that's for the special Christians. That's for the super spiritual Christians. That's for the, the people that, are, that, that, that aren't me. Acts 15, 12. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul. The guy who killed Christians. The guy who sat there. Remember Stephen? The guy that sat there and watched him have rocks thrown at his body until he was dead. That Paul. Told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Listen, I don't think any, unless you're hiding something that I'm totally not aware of, nobody here has been involved in a plot to have Christians murdered. And yet God says, I'll do it through him. I'll do it through Stephen. I'll do it through the apostles. And just in case you sit here this morning and go, it's not me. He says, I'll do it to men. I'll do it to women. I'll do it to young. I'll do it to old. I'll do it to slave. I'll do it to free. I'll do it to anyone who calls on my name. You are a part of the everyone. And you, listen, listen, hear me here. That might scare you a little bit, and it probably ought to. That's an amazing amazing thing but listen I believe that God wants to use you to do signs and wonders I believe that God wants you to be a type of person who lays your hands on the sick and prays over their body and they get well okay I, want, I think God is the type of God who says, I want you to be the type of person who says, you know what, I'm sorry that you're going through financial situations and difficulties. I'm sorry that you're having trouble in your home and your family. But you know what, we're going to pray and we're going to ask that God does something that only God can do and God responds. He wants to do that in your life. Listen to what Hebrews 2 through 4 says, or 2 4 says, and God confirmed his message, confirmed his message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. He is choosing you to be someone that he uses to make an impact. Because remember, remember, we're going to continue to build on this, so just hold on. Remember earlier, there's people out there who are sitting there and they're going, God, if you're real, God, if you really love me, will you send a sign? Because here's the thing. Our God doesn't just want to do signs and wonders for you. He doesn't just want to do signs uh, through you. He wants you to be 
the sign and wonder someone is waiting for. He'll do them. He'll do them through you. But even greater, I believe, is God wants you to literally be that sign and that wonder that someone is waiting for. Listen, we're going to go and look in Isaiah. Let me give you a context before we jump there, okay? In Isaiah, basically, uh, the, the, the lands of Judah and Israel, they're not living the way they should. They have kind of turned their backs on God. They are dealing with some, some sin and things like that. Isaiah is there to kind of, kind of draw to bring the people back before judgment really comes and all these sort of things. And we're going to be in Isaiah 8. But in Isaiah 7, we see this idea, and you can read it and things like that, where the people begin to kind of ask for a sign. And, 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 and the, somebody says, well, I don't know if I want to ask for a sign and all these things. And in, in Isaiah 7, we find a very, very popular, very, very well-known portion of Scripture around Christmas time where Isaiah prophesies, you know, there's going to be a sign. And here's the sign. The sign is that the virgin will have a child, and we will call his name Emmanuel. So the context here is signs. The context here is kind of what's going on, but it's also a season of sin. It's also a season of, of where the people of, of Israel and Judah are not listening to God. They've kind of gone their own way. And so now let's pick up the story here in Isaiah 8, 1. Look at what it says. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Make a large signboard and clearly write this name on it. Maher Shalah Hash Bazah. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? it? Listen, if you want to find some funny, crazy stuff, read what God asked some of the prophets to do. You know, like, I, I mean, how many of you, don't raise your hands, but just think about it. Like, are you a visual learner? Like, I am a visual learner. Like, I like to see things, you know, like my wife has learned. Like, when she'll try to tell me something about what she wants to do around the house or build something or whatever, she's like, she just learned, like, I got to draw it. I got to show him what it looks like. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Do you want to do that? Like, that's how I learned. For whatever reason, I think the Israelites, or at least part of them and, and, and people, they were visual learners because God would ask them to do some of these, sometimes some weird things to help them to see. And this is kind of one of those stories. So basically, God comes to Isaiah and he says, I want you to make a sign and write this name on it. Put this name on it. Now, I think it's interesting that basically he does this. You know, I mean, you, you ever, you know, seen the people, you know, like in the old football games or baseball games and they hold up the John 3.16 sign? You know, that's, that's where this came from. I don't have no idea. I don't know. But anyway, that's what he does. He makes himself a sign. Now, here's the deal. We've got to understand this. This name here, I'm not going to try to butcher it again because I think I butchered it the first time, but it's in your notes. This means something. It means swift to plunder and quick to carry away. Okay? That's what this name means. So, when the people of Israel or Judah saw this sign, that's what they would understand. Okay? Like, when we read it, we just go, Huh? Why? So that's what they would see. They see this sign that Isaiah is holding up. It's basically, you know, quick to plunder, quick to carry away, swift to... This is what it would mean, okay? Now let's continue on with the story in Isaiah 8, 3 through 4. This is what it says. It says, Then I slept with my wife, as again Isaiah is speaking, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Call him Mather Shalah Hazbezah. For before this child, listen, before this child is old enough to say Papa or Mama, the king of Assyria will carry away both the abundance of Damascus and the riches of Sumeria. Okay? So first, God says, make a sign. Put the name on the sign. And then later on, obviously at least nine months, we have a child born. And God goes to Isaiah and says, listen, I want you to name the child this. And so he does. He names the child this. So here's the deal. Any time that basically this kid is called. I mean, can you imagine that for a second? Okay. So, so here's the baby. Okay. This is wonderful, isn't it? You know, like, like you know, you, you have the child. You're all excited. You come up. And what do you ask? What's the baby's name? And boy, I remember, like, like, we still do this, you know, it's like, oh, his name is this, and it means this. I remember as a kid, you got these little cards, at least we did as kids, and had your name, Aaron, and then blah, 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 whatever it meant in the Lord, you know. I remember my sister, my sister's name is Sarah, and it was Princess 
and she would always remind us of that, you know? It's like, my, my name means princess. And I said, then maybe you should start acting like your name. You know, and I mean, no, I was mean. I was older brother, you know? But we would do that. Oh, it means this, or oh, it means that. And that's great. Can you imagine Isaiah and his wife? Here's our child. Really? Oh, he's so adorable. What you name him? Swift to plunder and quick to carry away. Huh? Yeah. Looks just like his daddy, doesn't he? You know. Like, wait, wait a minute, God. What? What, what do you mean? Why? And he says, before this baby is old enough to basically talk, these things are going to happen. His name is going to happen. Now you go, well, that's a weird story. But listen to what it says in Isaiah 8, 17 through 18. Listen. Once again, here we go. I will wait for the Lord who has turned away from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my hope in him. Isaiah is speaking here. Listen. I and the children the Lord has given me serve as signs and warnings to Israel from the Lord of heaven's armies who dwells in his temple on Mount Zion. What did God do? He made the child the sign. He made him the sign. God has called you God has called me to not just experience his signs and wonders, to not just have them work through us with his power, but to literally be the sign to people. You need to understand that. In our world today, there are people, and there are more and more, I believe, every single day that are crying out, God, I need a sign. God, I need to do, have experienced you. If you're there, if you're real, will you do something in that? And what I have found over and over and over is the thing that God wants to send the most is not, quote unquote, a sign or a wonder, but a person that is a sign and a wonder. You go, Aaron, I'm not a sign. I'm not a wonder. Have you experienced the salvation of Jesus? Yes, you're a sign and a wonder. Have you experienced God's goodness and his faithfulness? And I would say you have. You're a sign and a wonder. And it's time that we begin to be the sign and the wonder that God has called us to be. But too many of us, we get to this time of waiting and this time of, of patience and all these things and we have forgotten that when we are asking for a sign, when we're asking for direction, that God is calling us to be the same to someone else. To allow ourselves to be used by Him in that way. Listen, this is what Paul says in Romans 10. This is a powerful verse that we need to understand. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that a wonderful verse? We hold on to that. Yes, write it on your fridge. Put it on your bumper sticker. Whatever. But you know what? He doesn't stop there. Listen, but how can they call on Him to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent that is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news you see here's what i believe i believe that people are looking for a sign i believe that people are looking for somebody to walk into their lives and say you know what you know what? God has done something amazing in me and through me. And I'll be assigned to you. I'll be there for you. I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll minister to you. I'll do it when it's not fun, it's not easy, and it's not convenient. I'll be that sign. And I think that's so important. Because you know what? They're not going to know unless we go. They're not going to know. And here's what I found. This is what's even more dangerous. Okay? When you and I don't go, listen, people will fill in the blanks. And I'll be honest with you. I've talked to a lot of people. When people fill in the blanks, there's some weird stuff that comes up. So not only do we need to be the sign, when we are lacking of a sign, they'll find their own sign. They'll find their own wonder. And, and I'm going to be real clear on this, guys. 
Uh, this is just something that God's been kind of pr- showing me over the last, I would say, a couple years now. And, and, and I think this is very indicative of the time that we live in and the lateness of the hour, okay? Like, there was a time, at least in my own life, where, where there was kind of like three sides. There was God, there was His side, and there was the enemy, and then there was just kind of this middle ground. And it was just kind of like, it wasn't necessarily bad, it wasn't necessarily good, it was just kind of, uh. You remember those days? I don't think those days were then, and I don't think they're now. I think it's either life and life abundance in Jesus and God, or I think it's kill, steal, and destroy of the enemy. There is no middle ground. And I think that people are looking for something that is a sign to them of life. Because everything else that is not found in Jesus, hear me, will eventually lead to death and destruction and everything that goes with it. And we have to get that. God has called us all to be the sign that someone is looking for. So listen, let's end this this section here with just a little application, okay? So this is very simple, but let's kind of break this down. So, So obviously what this means or what God wants us to do is to be the sign that someone is waiting for to point them to Jesus. Okay, so how how does that how do we do that? How do we how do we how do we do that in, in real types of words? Okay? Here's, here's how I see this, okay? How many of you have ever been driving at night? Okay? And, and maybe you've driven on some areas, like when I was in college, I would drive from, from Springfield back to Kansas City, and if you've ever driven that area, it, it, there's a lot of farmland through there. It's very, very dark. There's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of street lights or that, or maybe you've driven in other areas around the country where there isn't a lot of those things. And here's what I've always found, as you kind of drive on those areas, and when it's really, really dark, you'll look, and maybe way up into the distance, you'll see something. You'll see a light. You know, what is that? And, you, and maybe you've driven it before, so you know what it is. And usually it's a gas station, you know? And so there's the light. It's illuminated. It's there. You can see it. You know from a distance it's there. As you get closer, it gets more clear. You begin to see the lights of everything else. But I also have driven at times in those same situations where the light was out. And when the lights are out, you drive right on past And for some of us, we say that, you know what, I I know I need to be the sign, but let's be honest, our lights are out. Or worse, we have a light switch on our lights. Okay? How many of you ever, uh, this is a good way to describe this in a weird way, I know. But but you got a Krispy Kreme? Yeah, I got a few smiles. Okay? And, And you know what they have on the front of the Krispy Kreme building? The hot now light. And, and you turn the light on, and they're just, they just came out, and they're hot, and they're delicious. Sometimes if you look really pitiful, they'll give you one for free. I've worked on my pitiful face, you know. But you know what? That light has a... And a lot of us, when we are asked to be a light, when we are asked to have our sign lit, we have a switch. Oh, it's convenient. My light's on. Oh, you know, uh, that's not necessarily what I want to do. It's not what Jesus says. That's not the type of sign we're supposed to be. Look at Matthew 5, verse we've heard before. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Basically, what's he saying? Turns their light off. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. Why? So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Some of us need to understand that the sign that we need to be is needs to be lit all the time. Because we never know when someone's going to need the light. We're never going to always see that moment. You're not going to be like, well, you know, it's, it's Tuesday. Therefore, I know God's going to need me to be like, I'll turn it on. I'm ready. No, 
God will bring people at the strangest times, at the strangest hours, and it'll be a time for you to be a sign and a wonder, and God's going to ask you, is your light on? Are you going to point them to me? Are you going to show them who I am? We have to be a sign and help people in those ways discover who Jesus is. But not only do we need to be a sign, but God also has asked us to be the wonder someone is waiting for to point them to Jesus. The wonder, the sign and the wonder. What does that mean? What do I believe that means? I believe that in a lot of ways, the wonder comes from our testimony, from what God has done in you and through you. It's the ability to share those things and communicate those things with people. Listen, listen, a sign at times can just stand there, but a wonder has to speak out. And I think that's important. Look at Revelation 12, 11. And they conquered him, him is the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Your testimony is powerful. What God has done in your life can help change someone else's life. And we have to understand that. Some of us, we're doing fine just being a light, but we're just sitting there. And we're doing the best we can. But you know what? Sometimes God says, I need you to speak out the things I've done. I need you to share the things that I've done. You need to sit there with someone or a friend or a coworker or a teacher or whoever, somebody in your family, and say, you know what? Let me share the wonders that God has done in me. Let me tell you about the times where he was faithful and he did what only he can do. God's called you. He's anointed you. He's prepared you. And a lot of times, all of those things happen as we wait on him. See, it's not a curse, it's a blessing. It's not a curse because the blessing is that you are being more and more prepared to be the sign and the wonders that people need. There are people in your families, there's people in your home, there's people in your workplace, there's people all around you that are sitting there and they're praying a type of that prayer. God, if you're real, will you send me a sign? God, will you show me if you really care, if you really love, if you really are there for me? And he's saying, I have called you to go and to be that sign for them. I have called you to walk into their lives and be the type of person who says, you know what? There is a God and he loves you. He has a plan for your life and you can trust that. Be the sign, be the wonder. Allow him to do signs and wonders in you and through you. He's a God of signs and wonders. But we always remember that these point people to Jesus and allow them to so that they can want. See, here's what's great about this. Here's great about God's plan. When you are a sign and wonder and you point people to Jesus and Jesus does in their heart and their lives what he's done in your heart and his life, guess what gets reproduced? A sign and a wonder. You say, oh, I've heard this oh so many times in my life. Oh, I just, I want to see the signs and the wonders that, oh, I just want to see them. I want to see them. I want to see them. Great, great. Go be light. Go be salt. Go bring people into the kingdom and you will see the most amazing signs and wonders you've ever seen. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I want somebody who's dead to come alive again. I, I want somebody who's got cancer to be healed. Well, I do too. But you know what I've learned? Those are temporary fixes. I like it when my God does permanent things. Because here's the deal. If you have cancer and God heals you, hallelujah, we will celebrate that and have and will. But you know what? Unless Jesus comes back first, you're still going to die. You're still going to die. But when we accept Jesus... And there's a sign and a wonder there. Jesus told us, even though we die, we will live. My God does permanent things. 
I want those signs and wonders to be a part of my life, to be a part of your life, and to be a part of the church today. And he wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use us all to be that. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Really, in a lot of ways, I've, I want to conclude shortly, you know, be quick here, I, I promise, the series, okay? So as we take a step back, as we look at the entire series, I know that many of you have come to me and, and shared kind of tongue-in-cheek about, you know, thank you so much for preaching this, stop, you know. I, I know I've been challenged as well in some of these things, but I also recognize and understand that this is not easy stuff. Waiting on the Lord is hard. It's hard because we want it now. And sometimes the things we want are really great things, great promises and, and things that God has promised to do in us and, and to our friends or our family or our situations. And, and it's hard to wait. It is. It really is. And, and, and I share that with so many of you. I know that there are people really all over the world that I know that are in that waiting season. And, 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 and here's the thing. Like, like I sit there just as anxious as you do. I sit there and pray just as fervently as you do for you. That God, God, is it time? God, is it time? God, can you bring that promise now? God, can you, God they, they, they've waited so long. God, can you do this in their hearts and their lives today? And so it's hard for me to wait with you at times. But at the same time, there is such a power and there's such a blessing that comes as we trust and we wait on the Lord. And I want to conclude this series with really where this series really sprang from in my own heart and in my own life. Several years ago, I'm not going to get into the details for time and just, just other things, Myself and my family, we were going through a very difficult season. A season where it just felt like, God, I know you're there, but, you know, we talked about this earlier. You remember the, the, the things that last week we talked about, the things that we, we do wrong? Well, that didn't come from just, that came from my own head. I do that. I, I will sit there and go, God, you must be focused on something else. God, I must not have your favor. God, God I must have done something wrong or whatever it might be. And, and my wife and I, Emily and I were just talking and praying and just trying to figure this out. And God, why? Why do we have to wait? What is going on? All these sort of things. And this was really her. And, and she began to share something with me. And she says, you know, Aaron, God's going God's to do his promise. God's going God's to complete his promise for you and for, for us and our family. And, you know, I would love to say I was the spiritual leader of my home. And I, yes. You know, take me to the Red Sea, I'm going to part it. But, you know, I'll be honest with you. I wanted to be like, Em, I love you, but can you just be quiet? I'm sorry. That was me. God, I'm, I'm just tired. And, and, and her, her desire to basically say, no, I'm not going to let you just have a pity party. She said, no, no, God is going to be faithful in this area. And you know what's interesting? God gave her a verse. God gave her a little something. And she was wise enough and smart enough to understand that sometimes during the waiting time, you need a sign. You need a sign. And for some of you, you've been waiting for a sign. And in that moment, my wife got that from the Lord. And, and you know what? All of a sudden, she said, we got to get this sign. And we got to get it made. Because we got to remember. We got to remember that his promises are yes and amen. We need to remember that when God makes you a promise, no matter how long you have to wait, it will come to pass. It will take place. It'll be in God's timing as we've looked at it and all those things that God wants to do in the time that it takes that he desires to do in us and through us. But you know what? The promise is still going to happen. Look at it with me. Genesis 9, 12 through 13. God said, this is the sign of the promise I am giving to you and every living being that is with you for generations to come. I will put my rainbow in the clouds to be a sign of my promise 
to the earth. Aaron, what does that have to do with any of this? You're talking about Noah. You're talking about a flood. You're talking about those things. No, I'm talking about a sign. A sign that God spoke to me and my family that says, and God put his rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise. It hangs in our front room. Every time I go down the stairs, I see it. Listen, some of you came here this morning. You didn't even know you were going to come. And God spoke to you and you said, you know what, God, I could really use a sign. I could really use some, some direction. I could really, I'm going through a hard time in my life. I've heard this series the last five weeks and it's just rubbed me on the, the wrong way and it's been hard and I don't understand. God, where are you? God, what are you doing? Listen, God is giving you a sign that the promise he made you is going to come forth. You think him and I are special? You're crazy. You're crazy. Some of you need to know you walked in, I'm looking for a sign. Here's your sign. Here's your sign. You say, Aaron, I don't know why I've been going through these things. Where is God? Why isn't he doing these things? He's got a promise. And he's going to put a rainbow in your sky. Your rainbow has been this series. It's been that sign that says, I haven't forgotten my promise. I haven't forgotten you. My promise will come. Well, you see, what's the point of this whole series? It's simple. It was a rainbow. It was a rainbow. So that you could see it and you could go, no, 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 no. His promise is still true. His promise is still yes and amen. Some of you need to find your own sign and allow God to come in this moment and once again put that sign in your heart and in your life that God will do what he promised he would do. I don't know when, I don't know how, and probably you don't either. But I know that when my God makes a promise, it's done. Amen. And some of you have held on and waited for promises for decades. And this series and today and all the things, God wanted to look at you and say, you know what? The rainbow's still there. It's my sign not anybody else's sign. And it's a sign of my promise to you. Not just to the special people, but to all his people. Let's bow our heads, let's close. Father, we come to you right now. And Father, as we look back on today and on this whole series, Father, I understand because I've experienced it, I am experiencing it. It's hard to wait on you. It's hard to wait on the promises because some of the promises are really, really good. And we want them. And we want them now. But God, your timing is perfect. God, your plan is perfect. And Father, it's so easy as we've talked about kind of today and throughout this series that as we wait, we do it passively. We sit, we pray, we kind of hide waiting for the promises. But God, as we've looked at through this series, that's not what that means. Waiting is action. Waiting is being a servant. Waiting is being willing during that time to be a sign and a wonder. To people. Father, all the things we're waiting on, God, you want to use us to help other people find you during that waiting season. And that's great. And that's fine. And that's dandy. And we thank you for that. But God, at the same time, there's still promises that we're waiting on. 
And Father, as I believe you desired and as you've done in my heart, in my home, in my family, Father, there are promises that you are going to keep. I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't need to. You know the time, you know the season, you know the place. But God, your promises are yes, and we say amen. Yes and amen. And so, Father, if there are individuals online or in the church this morning who walked in and said, you know what, God, I need a sign. I need, to, I need a sign. Father, I pray that they saw their sign today. They didn't see it in a person. They didn't see it in a worship service. They didn't see it in a preach. They saw it in you. You are the promise maker and the promise keeper. You are all that we need. So here's the deal. Maybe you're online. Maybe you were in this service this morning and you, you've, you've been that person. You know, you've, you don't know Jesus. You kind of, Jesus is kind of this person. Or maybe you filled in your own blanks because quite honestly, Christians haven't done a very good job being signs and wonders to you. You know, being a sign and wonder is hard. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we do wrong things. God's still fixing us and cleaning us up and helping us. And you've kind of filled in your own and you said, you know what, God, if you're real, God, if you really love me, send me a sign. Well, guess what? He loves you. He's got a plan for you. This isn't an accident or an oops or a coincidence. If you need a sign, God's given it and he's given it real clear. You need him. He is who you need. Not other things, not other people. You need Jesus. And here's the deal. Just like the Pharisees, just like the people of Jesus' time, you can accept that, what's right in front of you, and the sign that God has done, or you can reject it. That's your call. But if you want to accept it, it's very easy. Scripture tells us that if we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth, that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. We'll be saved. When we do that, God takes care of the rest. And maybe for some of you, you've been screaming for a sign. Here's your sign. For others of us, maybe it's time that we stop so focused on the sign and start being the sign and the wonder. Yeah, God's going to do it. God's going to bring it about. He's going to bring his promise. But you know what? Let's leave that in his hands. And in the time that we have, let's be the sign to someone else. Let's be the wonder to someone else. Let's grow in the midst of the waiting season. Because this isn't a curse, it's a blessing. And it can be a blessing to you and to countless others if we will allow God to do it. So no matter where you're at this morning, God desires to minister to you exactly where you are, whether it's to accept him for the first time or to allow yourself to once again be used in the ways that he desires to use you. Maybe for some of you, you just just feel like, you know what? Somebody else can be the sign. No, no, no. God's called you. He has a plan for you. He wants to anoint you. And some of us, maybe this morning, just need to accept that and allow God to do that. You maybe just feel like the Lord's speaking that, that, that you've said no to the Lord for a very long time. And Jesus, again, is calling on you, and he's saying today, will you answer my call? Will you be the sign of the wonder I've called you to be? He's calling you again. The excuses that we've used just don't hold water when our Jesus calls us, and he's called us all to be that sign and that wonder to people that need him. So wherever you're at this morning, will you pray with me? Wherever you're at, I remember there's things obviously that I missed, but wherever you're at, just begin to pray. 
And let's pray together. Father, we come to you right now. And God, first, God, we want to thank you for loving us so much, for making a way where there was no way, for God, for being a God of signs and wonders. And not only that, being a God that wants to use us to bring forth signs and wonders, like in the book of Acts and, and, and throughout our world even today. And more than that, that God, that you called us to literally be a sign and a wonder to people that need to know you, to point them to you. God, that is so amazing. But God, if there are individuals here this morning that don't know you, that God, they would see their sign. They would see that the Lord has a plan for them, that he loves them. It doesn't always mean that life is going to be perfect or there's not going to be hard times. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. We're going to experience those things. But at the same time, we can walk it with Jesus. Because Jesus, you said you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. So Father, for those right now, that God, they would say, God, I believe Jesus, that you are God's son. I believe that you came and you lived a sinless life and you died and on the third day you rose from the dead. And because you rose, you paid the penalty and the price for my sin. So Jesus, I accept you as Lord. I accept you as Savior. Forgive me, Lord, of all the sin. Clean me, make me white as snow, just like you promised you would do. Because Jesus, we even read it this morning, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we're calling out right now and knowing that that promise is good as well. And Father, for everybody else, that God, we're, we're in the waiting season, God, but let us be that sign and wonder. Father, for those that throughout this series have, have kind of had these moments and it's been maybe hard or easy depending and because they are waiting for that promise. They're waiting for that moment. They're waiting for those things to take place in their life. God, I pray that they saw a sign today. And that sign says, I will put a rainbow in the sky. And it will be a sign of my promise that today, Father, they saw that rainbow and were reminded that your promises are yes and amen. Father, we love you. We thank you, even though it's hard, for the waiting seasons. We thank you for the growth and the life change that can happen in us and through us during that time. And Father, we ask that you would just continue, even though as we wrap this thing up, that Father, from now on, even though it'll be hard, God, when the waiting time comes, we won't look at it as a curse. We won't look at it as a punishment. Instead, we'll look at it as an amazing opportunity and an amazing blessing as we wait for you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Awesome. So listen, thank you for being here. Thank you for hanging through this series. Like I said, I know it wasn't always easy, but I think it was really, really important. Remember, out in the foyer, there are uh, sign-up sheets for the community groups. Please sign up. Please sign up as soon as you can so that we can get these things going as quickly as we can because I think it's going to be a really great uh, fall semester and I'm excited about it. So please sign up. Don't forget about that. Next week is Jason's Deli and all that. Have a great week. For those that are online, man, we love you. We hope that you're doing well. We hope to see you soon and hope that you had a great uh, service with us this morning. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Love you.